Good evening, good evening. My name is Christina Lynch, and I am presenting tonight on business planning for farmers. So um, this is the last workshop in the series for the first series on the Tallahassee. <laughs> no worries. Um, this is the last program in the series um, for the Farmers Promotion Program. Um, it is not the last workshop, but it's just the last one that we started in January with Sundiata of Compost Community. Um, and we're going to close that with some business planning. So thank you for those who have attended. Welcome for those that are new. Um, I am. The, this is my first time presenting this year. So um, if you have any questions or comments, let me know. And they will be fed to me so that way I can answer them swiftly. And then for those in person, if you have any questions, feel free to interject and raise your hand. So about the Tallahassee Farmers Promotion Program, um, this is a free program to the folks in really anywhere if you're virtual, but in Jefferson, Leon, and Gadsden County. And this is one component of many. So in addition to the workshops that we'll have on business planning, value-added production, accounting, and tax, we'll soon have opportunities for free training for Serve Safe certification, as well as um, some value-added production processing opportunities to come about. So please. Um, if you haven't registered for our newsletter, please get with Audrey McNair um, to be able to be added to the list. So with that being said, I am Christina Lynch. I am your presenter for tonight. Um, my background is accounting, finance, and HR. And I've been working with small businesses and entrepreneurs for over 15 years. Um, I'm also an herbalist, so I know some about the plants, um, but really I'm here to support you with business planning and with the accounting. So anything relating to numbers, I, that's my expertise. So today we'll talk about the business plan outline, the breakdown of the business plan, and then any questions. So again, let me know. We, we don't have to wait until the end to ask questions, but we can have a conversation and discussion throughout. So with the business plan, it's a formal document that's meant to state your goals and the, the, who, who the audience is really is up to you. So for some folks, it's a way to hold themselves accountable. As we know, when we once we write it down, you're more likely to accomplish the goal. Um, it could be for a banker, for an investor, um, depending on what you're trying to do with the business plan. Um, I am a big fan nowadays. If you're not going for financing and need to have the traditional business plan, there might be components that are not as critical to you, depending on the purpose of the plan. So like visual plans are definitely a thing nowadays, or if we're just focusing on one specific area, like um, you have an established business, but you're trying to expand your market. Maybe you have a plan, but it focuses heavy on the marketing aspect of it and the market research. So with that, we're gonna dive into the first part, which is the executive summary. This is your first chance to get, to get the reader's attention. It's normally written last, because it's supposed to summarize all of the components of the business. So we're talking about that market research, knowing what's going on within your industry. Um, it, it's also including that marketing strategy, what your qualifications are or those of your team, and that financial plan. So the executive summary, though we can start writing it first, you may, by the time you finish every other um, section, you may have a different perspective on your own goals once you've done your research and looked and seen what can you accomplish in which time frame. So I normally exercise that we normally do um, is we'll have a very rough draft in the beginning and then we finalize it at the end just to kind of see our progress throughout the project. Um, so it's a great way of knowing even how you as a business owner have evolved over time. Um, and then it should paint a clear picture and some of the questions that we want to answer are what's the nature of the opportunity or problem? So thinking about what, are you, what solution are you, you know, what's your solution and to what problem, right? So if you're selling radishes, oh, matter of fact, I'm gonna go back a second. So no, no, let's go back to radishes. If you're selling radishes and you have a radish that doesn't normally grow in this area, and we know that right now the promotion of local food and restaurants is great. You know, there's a lot of creativity that's flowing through those restaurants. They're trying new things and you have this product, this produce, and you're one of the only folks that are selling it. You're one of the only farmers that's selling it. There's a great opportunity for you to collaborate with other restaurants to create new dishes. Um, I'll, I'll use Legacy Greens as a great example. They do the uh, microgreens, but when they're marketing, what are they marketing? They're marketing the restaurants. 
and the entire dish with their microgreen on it. So they're not just focusing on the one product. And here's the benefits of microgreens, but they're also leveraging their collaboration and partnerships and saying, hey, here's our opportunity to take something that has been normally overlooked or something that's normally of a smaller product and garnish. Now we're trying to be the main supplier in the restaurant industry for local specialized restaurants, right? For the local farm to table restaurants. So what is the opportunity for you and what problem are you solving or is important? Um, what's the size of the opportunity? Is it a multi-million dollar opportunity? And what research can you find that states that? Are there trends that are saying, hey, now we're showing that the trend is going into this direction because we want to be able to support what we're actually saying. Um, how is the opportunity created? So maybe it's something, maybe it's a new idea and you're like, you know what, I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to create the opportunity for myself, right? I'm, I know that with me, I, like, I love plants, I love accounting, and it took me 10 years to figure out, you know what, I can support farmers, I can support holistic providers because I've recognized in my tenure that most accounting people don't speak that language. I've recognized in accounting, there's only now it's 2% of accountants are black, but also that there is a lack of emotion that tend, that's typically in your relationship with your accountant. So by integrating care and empathy, I can create my own market. So I'm creating my own opportunity versus trying to follow a path that's already been followed, that's already been um, drafted or crafted for someone. And then why is this the time to grasp the opportunity? Um, when we think about what our goals are, hey there, um, what our goals are and what we're, trying to, what we're trying to accomplish, why is this the time for the bank to want to finance? Why is this the time for someone to invest? Why is this the time for you to quit your job? Why is this the time for you now to change the direction of your business? So the executive summary is supposed to really evoke some emotion and tell this compelling story in two pages or less. So this is why we write it last. So for the mission statement, you know, the mission statement is supposed to define the business, your values, and what you want to accomplish. So this is close to, this is going to be like your biggest action statement, right? This is what we're doing. And then it's going to answer the who, what, and where. So that's the foundation of your business. Why are you getting up every day and going on the farm? Why are you getting up every day and serving your purpose? So what is your mission statement? And then it should answer questions of why does your business exist? What purpose does your business serve? And then where is your business headed? So what is the direction? So yes, you're growing food, you're growing produce, but what is the particular purpose for doing so? Because over time, you're going to find out if you haven't already, there's certain things you love to grow and there's certain things that you just don't care to do. How did you make those decisions? Was it simply based on demand? Was there this happiness that comes from it? Was it stories that were told? So really trying to incorporate, you know, what you're doing and why you're doing it into that mission statement. So we want to set goals that are smart. So specific, measurable, attainable, rewarding, and time bound. So the idea is, again, we want to be able to hold ourselves accountable. Um, I saw... Today, literally, um, as I was actually on the other side of the participant, someone said smarter goals. So they added extending and rewarding. So, and it kind of like, for me, it evoked a little, you know, it, it piqued my interest because I was, I know, I'm like, yeah, I know smart goals that have to be something I can measure, be held accountable for, all of these things. But I never thought about it from a standpoint of how is it rewarding to me? Like what, am, you know, I'm not just setting a goal to set a goal because we want to make sure we have purpose and we enjoy what we do every day. That's part of our work-life balance. But even saying, how is this going to extend, you know, how is it stretching us? Because the whole point of the goal is for us to really fulfill a dream, right? We're just finding a way of defining what that dream is and how we're going to make it. But it's also going to assist us in growing. So that extension of where we currently are to something greater and then what's that reward for them? So the goals can be short term, which are less than a year, or long term. Um, if you have a big goal, it's okay to have like many goals to make the big goal, you know? Um, like my goal this year, and it tickles people, but like my goal is to exercise more. I hate exercising. 
with a passion. It's just like my mindset. I'm trying to transform the mindset. And so I was like, well, I'm going to exercise twice a week. And so what I did was I intentionally made sure I signed up with my client because I have to go see them twice a week. And so like this morning I went because they wanted me to drop something off. Where have you been at? Man, you know I had to go do this, 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 and that. And they're like, I ain't trying to hear none of that. You're supposed to be at the gym. Why haven't we seen you? It's been two weeks because I know I need someone to hold me accountable. Now, the reality is, is that, you know, they were like, well, you need to come five days a week. Whoa. Let's start at two. Let's start at two. <laughs> because if I can't make it to two, I'm not going to make it to five. So, so my short term goal is let me get there two days a week. My long-term goal is, yeah, it'd be nice for me to work out five days a week. But right now, it's a mental issue. I'm not going because I just don't like to go. It's not enjoyable. So I'm exploring my options to figure out what's most enjoyable to me. But that's my way of breaking up the bigger goal into smaller goals. So if your goal is, I want to be a $3 million farm or $3 million business, absolutely. But what can we do this year? Like, you know, what can we do in three years? And then we'll make sure that it's something that's actually attainable so that way we don't get discouraged. So sometimes we make these big grand goals, but we don't give ourselves the time that we need to get to that goal. And then we give up because we're like, oh, it's too hard or, oh, everything went against me or all of these things. So when we're setting our smart goals or smarter goals, we want to make sure that we can identify the, the time frame and is this a short-term goal or a long-term goal or is this something that we can break up to make sure that we're con continuously making progress. For the operations plan, um, I know that Sundiata spoke about this a couple months ago, but I wanted to bring it back full circle because it is a part of the business plan. And this is like, how do you make the business run? So where is the operation located? That's important. So if we're talking about farms, right, that's not just, here's the address. What's the terrain? What's the land like? You know, are there restrictions? You know, what is the opportunity that is available to you? How are you going to be able to manage that land? So it's not just the land is located in Monticello, but maybe the land is located on a five acre plot, you know, on the east side of Monticello, where the land, where the, you know, where the, um, the ground has clay currently, and we're gonna do all these things. There's no trees on it, so we know that we may need to plant things for shade, but when we say where is it, it's, it's getting into the details, because depending on who you're writing it for, no one knows all of that. And sometimes you don't even know all of that. You gotta dig deep to figure that out too. You're like, it's land. But then when you really think about it, what's the soil like, you know? What can I plant depending on the part of the land um, that you're going to utilize? You know, what are all of these aspects that come with that? Um, how did the operation begin? If you're already in business, we want to tell that story. Again, this is, your, this is the business's story, the business's identity. So crafting this plan it is your, your way of really sharing the story of your business. And if you haven't started, how are you going to start that operation? Because there's a lot of steps involved. And it's not as easy as, and a lot of folks think, you know, I'm just going to go get my LLC and we're good. But there's a lot of steps involved. Do you need certain licenses in place? You know, do, what kind of equipment do you need? Who's going to manage the equipment? If, you know, what are, do you have insurance and protections? What are the supplies looking like? Do you have that accounting software? Because that, you know, we got to make sure that we know where the money's going. So all these things come into play. So if you're not in business, in operations, what does that look like? And then how are you currently operating? Do you have procedures? And if you're passing this business down to someone else, do they have procedures? Like what information are you gonna be able to share? Or if you expand, and I hear this a lot, well, I can't find anyone because they don't know how to do it the way I need them to do it. Well, if it was documented, they could learn, or you have to teach them because no one knows the history of the business but you. Um, what is the general, you know, productivity, management, and situation of the business? So again, it kind of goes back to history, but you have to be able to give an analysis of where the business currently is. How is it being managed? You know, are you at your best production or could you do better? Um, this is something that I, I speak to myself with because I do talk to myself where I'll be like, man, I'm inefficient. 
And the most of the time I can tell because my bank account doesn't reflect my work. <laughs> and then I have to stop and say, well, hmm, let me look at my calendar. Let me look at my efforts. Am, are there roadblocks? Are there speed bumps? Or am I just being inefficient? And how can I be more productive? And then what's the situation? So are you looking for money? Are you looking for efficiency? Are you looking for expertise? Are you looking for people? But you know, all of the resources that are required for you to be in business and to operate, you know, what is the assessment of that? And then what are those general practices? So not necessarily procedures, but there might be philosophies or things that you do that make your business unique um, that we wanna write down. Are there legal or contractual obligations? So even though we're not talking about money necessarily in this section, we're gonna go ahead and start introducing that concept. So what obligations do you have? So do you, are you mortgaging the land and it's a 20 year mortgage? Because we do, you know, if you have loan obligations, that you know, is part of the story and part of your obligation, part of your commitment at a minimum to the business um, that you're operating on, that you're operating. And then permit certifications, things of the sort. Um, <clears throat> when we look at some businesses, farming operations, um, food, you know, even like I could say food service providers, how are they marketing themselves? They'll be like, oh, I have this certificate, we're certified organic, we're using this process. They, you know, they're quick to want to leverage and elevate their efforts of what they've done because that's part of their identity. So you're building your story here. And with that, what needs to be done or what can you do to be able to improve your operations and also kind of trickling in some marketing and start you know, looking at that brand. And then making sure that the summary of this operations plan is useful in helping the, the reader understand past and present operations. So when I say this, I don't mean that you have to literally write down how do you plant every you know, every plant or vegetable or fruit, but maybe you are documenting the entire process of this time of year, you know, we're going to prepare the seedlings this time of year, we put it in the ground, you know, what is the overall operations, not necessarily step by step every little piece. So I'm going to pause. Are there any questions or comments so far? We're good on the virtual world. Awesome. Is this good information? Am I going good. too fast? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. Just making sure. Doing a pulse. Sometimes I talk fast, so I'm like, let me just pause for a second. Thank you for taking a pulse. Oh, we always have great information. Thank you. <laughs> so for farm strategy, we want to gather information and conduct research on the business market. Um, <clears throat> depending on when you watch this recording for those in the virtual world. Um, if you need assistance in getting market research, I may be able to help you with that. So I do have access to Eva's World, which those reports are like $1,400 each. Wow. But it can help you with getting market research if that's something you're needing for your business plan. Um, what that's going to tell you is it gives you information on the national, state, and local level. So that's approximately how many farm businesses are in your area. What is the overall trend of the industry? Are you growing? Are you shrinking? Um, being able to look at what are other competitors doing and that just gives you an idea of the landscape of the entire industry. So like when I was writing my business plan and we were doing research a few months ago, it was saying that the accounting industry is actually um, shrinking in size because of technology, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's not, I'm not phased by that. So what? That has nothing to do with me because one, there's lack of representation in the industry. So I know that I have a market because one, I'm representing not just minorities, I'm representing immigrants, I'm representing you know, holistic providers and farmers. So I know that one, I'm not worried about that. But also what makes our business model different is we care and we show that we care and we show empathy. And when you go to most accounting firms, no offense to them, it's still pretty, you know, suits and ties. And you feel like, you know, you're almost like you have to like sit up straight <laughs> and you're in trouble. Versus you come in mind, you know, I've, got, I've been caught slipping, but I don't have my heels on. I'm walking barefoot. I'm like, ah, you're early. Let me get my heels back on. But, you know, the idea is, is that when you're thinking of even the market research is going to give you an idea of the overall trend. It, it's not meant to discourage you or overwhelm you. But what it's going to do is educate you on what's currently going on out there. And then it helps you. It's a, it's a baseline for you to then make your decision when you're thinking about, what everyone else is doing, and then what are you doing, and how are you going to differentiate yourself? 
using a SWOT analysis <clears throat> to summarize internal and external components. So this is when you got to kind of pump yourself up, boost yourself up. Like, what are you good at? What are your strengths? Is it, yes, we're growing, but what else is it? Is it branding? Is it selling at the market? Is it making connections? You know, is it training other farmers on your expertise, um, the weaknesses? What could you use improvement on? And the way I see weaknesses, those are opportunities. Because it's now, one, you can identify what you need assistance on, but then also how can you turn that into an opportunity? So if there's something that you're not good at, could you partner with someone that is good at it? And then looking at um, what opportunities exist. So what's out there? We talked about creating your own, but maybe you do find out, maybe the market research shows that, hey, there's some, you know, there's an opportunity here or there's a gap here. And you're like, oh, I can fill that gap. So now you're going to create the opportunity. Um, and then there's threats. So what external factors could stop you from what you're currently doing or stop you from growing? I think with um, the pandemic, we learned very quickly once you know log the logistics industry kind of was at a halt, everyone turned to local produce and local food because we realized very quick quickly the weakness in the food industry in our country, right? Mm -hmm. We rely on too many main providers. And that was a huge weakness that it took really literally the country shutting down for us to realize we don't even know how to get food. We, you know, we were so reliant on the mainstream that it was our weakness and it became a threat now because now that we're on the opposite side of it, a lot of people are good, are used to going to their local farmers. It's an opportunity for local farmers to remain connected, but it's a threat to the larger farmers, right? It's a threat to the grocery stores, right? So, and we see that now where you go to Publix or Whole Foods or whomever, and they now have the local section with the local farmers. And they're now trying to connect more to the communities. And it's a great opportunity. And that's how they're hedging their risk. And that's how they're hedging the threat. And it's a great way to remain connected. It lets consumers be engaged to try new things. And then also lets local farmers be able to sell a large inventory to another source. So that's an idea. So when we're doing the SWOT analysis, it can be scary if you really have to think about what those weaknesses and threats are. For some folks, they get scared trying to write down their strengths. So like, oh, I don't want to think like that. But it's like, no, we have to be able to look at all aspects of it because that's when we're going to be able to identify our strategies moving forward. And then resource inventory. So gather and analyze the resources that are available. The extension office has a plethora of resources that I'm going to be honest, I did not know existed. So big props to them. <laughs> but sometimes they have multiple uses. Um, so when you're looking at what resources are available, you know, what can you do with that? And then I'll also kind of plug in here, even um, we had the workshop on value-added production. So we know that there, you can grow and you can sell, but there's opportunities on the value-added production side where if you have excess, what can you do with the excess to, one, make it shelf-stable, to make it last longer, and find other customers that you may not usually sell to? So I, I mentioned, you know, we have the restaurants and the high-end specialty restaurants, where that's a huge trend right now, Right. And some of them have gotten, you know, slick and started having their own gardens. Mm -hmm. And they started being like, oh, I'm going to just go ahead and grow my own stuff. Um, I was speaking to a friend who's an herbalist, and she was saying, you know, I never really thought about it. But she's a bartender, right? So, I'm like, okay, yeah. But I never, it never really clicked until I talked to her over the weekend. She can be an herbalist at work. Because when we go and they're like, oh, we have, you know, we the, the orange bitters that goes into your old fashioned. She's making her herbal products at work, and she can, and they're paying for it. Wow! Because they want all of the trends, right? Mm -hmm. So the bitters and the vinegars and the syrups. So she's able to grow stuff and then create things and then sell it in a way that I would have never thought. I'm like, I would have never thought. Now I'm be like, I want to be an, I want to be a bartender that's an herbalist <laughs> because I'm like, man, now you're gonna pay for my mason jars, my. Because you know how much you can make? I'm like, I'm thinking myself, like, this is, that's a plug. Like, I wasn't thinking, but she put those two together. So what can, what you know, with the resources you have, what can you do with that? Because in my mind, well, bitters aren't that hard to make. So if you're a farmer that has oranges and citrus, you can make bitters to sell to the bars. But was that ever a thought, right? So looking at multiple uses for what the resources and things you're already growing. 
And then some benefits of having a complete resource inventory. One, um, completing balance sheets, making balance sheets easier to complete. One thing I'll say um, with your equipment and other resources that you have, financials are not sexy. I know that. I get it. Um, and I had a client that, you know, we were trying to work on financials. And I'm definitely a gut intuition person. So sometimes I do random stuff and I don't know why. So I was like, oh, we got all this equipment. Is it documented? No, we should really document it. Okay, but I need you to like really document. I need you to go and itemize everything that you have. So they itemized everything they had. We put values on it, created the balance sheet in the accounting system, X, Y, and Z. Two years later, a year later, one to two years later, um, needed financing, right? Went to the bank for financing because now you have this $30,000 of equipment on a balance sheet he was able to put a lien on his equipment versus a lien on his home. Because see, the banks always want to do that home thing. Right. It's like, no, you ain't gonna come and take my house. Mm -hmm. But all he did, he didn't do anything different other than just document what he already had because now you're showing the actual value of your business. When you don't document these items, you're making your business look like there's no value in it. So when you have all of this equipment and have all the inventory and the resources, it's best to document it that way if you have to go to the bank for financing or a line of credit, you can actually show a bigger, fuller picture of the business and it increases the value. Um, we want to be able to summarize collateral for a loan, which is what I went over, um, and also being able to list the conditions of assets. So if it's one thing when we use it every day or we walk by it and we know, oh, we know that trailer has a couple years and then I got to replace it, and then it's out of sight, out of mind when you walk away. Mm -hmm. When you have it listed down and you know these are my resources, this is where they are, we can then incorporate planning so that way we know, hey, in three years, we know we're going to have to purchase a new tractor. Do we want to go ahead and finance it or pay cash and start preparing for that? Because when you go to the bank, what do they ask for? Two years of tax returns, two years of financials. So when we think about our financial planning, we have to really know what do we need and when that way we can anticipate that on our financials. So I'm gonna plug in tax planning here for a second because there's a bis big misunderstanding that tax planning means paying less in taxes. <coughs> and yes, for some that's the goal, 100%. But I always ask, what are all of your goals, personal and you know, professional? Because if you're saying you're gonna buy a home in three years, the last thing you wanna do is drive down your net income. Because when you go to the bank, they're gonna say you don't qualify for tax. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's really important to be able to, one, show what you actually own and what you owe, but to prepare for that. So when we're thinking about financing for equipment, whether it's leasing or, you know, like a lease from a company or a traditional loan from the bank, um, we need two to three years to be able to anticipate that. That way you can prepare. And then having a relationship with the banker, because the bankers will bend some of the rules or work with you more when they know you. When they don't know you and you're just Joe Blow off the street, they're going to give you that hard line rule of sorry, can't help you because they have the numbers versus some of my clients will go and be like, hey, can you look at my tax return and let me know what would I qualify for with this? And then now they can prepare themselves a couple years in advance and the banker helps them with what they need to do before that time comes. Um, we want to evaluate opportunity for growth and diversification. If we know what we have, and what we're selling, and not necessarily for every individual vegetable and fruit that we're planning or we're selling, or um, but if we have like buckets and we know our sales from this, our sales from that, and we can tell where our money is going or coming from, we may be able to identify what's growing and what's what you know, what where are sales actually growing, where are sales actually shrinking. And do we need to diversify? <coughs> so selling one product and being good at one product is great. But if something happens to that, what's plan B? So to hedge our risk, we want to diversify what we offer. And then documents of resources. And then in ease, we want to make sure, like, if you have any type of... Um, in case of fire. In case of, yeah. Um, if, in case we have a fire, we want to make sure that you have everything documented because they're gonna ask you like, oh, can you provide a list of what was there or what was damaged? And that happened with my parents when their, their house got struck by lightning and it, you know, it, it got a big chunk of the house. 
And they were like, well, please document um, what you own, how much you paid for it, and you know, provide proof if you can. Who keeps proof of their fault clothes? Mm-hmm. And they're so, like, did you not hear me when I said there was a fire? It's gone. <laughs> like, you know, like, wh- where am I, where am I going to find this proof? He was like, did you see that? And the room was shard. Like, it's gone. The bed was like this. <laughs> like, the queen size bed, by the time they, the firefighters got there, it was just a pile. So when they were saying, but to the insurance, they don't know. They don't care. All they said was, we need a list of, of, of items that you have. So when you have your resources listed, it's a lot easier and quicker to file claims and to get recoup your losses versus if you don't have documentation, it's not. And we see that a lot with hurricanes where some homes, some businesses back bounce back quicker because they have their records in order and others, it's a longer process because they now have to go back and recreate documents or create documents to be able to respond. I'm gonna pause. Are there any questions or concerns or comments? No? Okay, perfect. So for our marketing strategy and our plan, you know, this is really when we're trying to reach out to share the great products and services that your business offers. So we're gonna focus on the four Ps. One is product. What products are you selling and why is it unique? I know sometimes it's like, it's a radish. I sell radishes. This is a great radish. And there's other times if you're having those value added, um, value added products, or, um, you know, sometimes I'll, or I'll, you know, you go to the market and I'll, and I'll hear where some folks will be like, oh, this is a sweet, you know, this one is sweet and juicy. I picked it at prime time and they're telling a story. It's not just this is a piece of fruit or this is a vegetable. They got a story to tell and they're able to convince the consumer to purchase it from them. So one, what is your product? What are you selling and why is it unique? Two, what is your pricing position in relation to the industry? Um, so how much value does your product offer? So what are you pricing in it? So one, what's your pricing philosophy? There you have really there's three positions. You're below market, you're at market, or you're above market. And we can see the same product if we were to go in town at three different stores, right? Dollar General has a perception that it's cheaper, but all they did was reduce the size and it's more affordable. Walmart will be like, yeah, we're going to give you the cheapest price we can. We're going to bang our vendors over the heads. We're going to give you the cheapest price. Target said, you're going to pay for this experience. And they're going to charge you a little more, but you're getting a good experience, right? It's the same thing. I'm sorry. Quality. Quality. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. They yeah. put the Starbucks in there too. So now you're like, now you're gonna give me that good caffeine. Now you know I'm gonna grab now you got extra energy in your arm to grab. So it's like bam, bam, bam. So, but you know, they have their pricing position and then none of no one is wrong, right? They just know this is what our pricing position is and this is our justification. This is who we're gonna meet, this is who we're reaching out to. So you know, I always joke and I say, like, I don't shop at Walmart. I mean, you catch me in Walmart occasionally, you know, depending. I'm not gonna lie. But, you know, when you go to Walmart, it's a different experience, right? The shelves may or may not be stocked. You know, there may or may not be a spill on the floor. You know, you may or may not get a cashier at the register. So there's all of these things. But they're like, look, we gave you the lowest price we can. So for us to give you that lowest price, we got to cut corners. And that's what they did. And that's and most people accept that, right? And that's their business model. That's what they based it off of is we're going to give you the most supportive price we can. Publix, when it comes to groceries, they came in and said, we're not going to give you the most the most affordable price. We're going to give you customer service instead. We're going to be friendly. We're going to be nice. If you ask us for something, we're going to walk you to it. And if the price is wrong, we'll give you one of those items for free. And that's their model. And people, there's a, there's a group of people that accept that model as well. And so they both, you know, Publix is a little bit above market. Walmart says, you're going to get the lowest price. And But what Publix started messing with them is that buy one, get one free. Mm-hmm. Right, so now they say, yeah, our price is a little high, but if you catch us every four weeks, you get a deal. <laughs> and they started that. And then, you know, once they started, and I remember it was a few years ago when they chose violence, and I walked in, and they had this sort of this high banner, and it had Publix price with the buy one get one free, and then it had Walmart's price, and it was showing that they were cheaper than Walmart. So then they started trying because they were trying to target a new market. They were like, we've already dominated this market. So now we want to get more minority shoppers. And so they went on this hardcore campaign, advertising on certain radio stations, having the buy one free being cheaper because they were like, well, hey, we've already got, we, we want to grow. 
but we've already tapped this market out. Everyone here has bought into the vision. So that who, what other grocery store thrives in, in Florida? No one else. So they tapped out. So now they're like, well, we want to go ahead and get the minority buy as well because we know we've already gone as far as we can with this buy. So thinking about what your price is and why. And it's okay. There's no wrong answer. Um, and sometimes to find that pricing position, that's why we have the market research. But also that might mean you have some grand, um, you know, feet on the ground, grassroots research, going around to see what everyone else is charging for the same um, product. Placement. So where will your products be sold? And where is your target market? So very important. It's depending on who you're trying to sell to will determine where you go. So the answer is not everyone. Yes, everyone eats fruits and veggies. Yes, everyone has to eat in general. But the answer is not everyone. If I go into five different restaurants, I'm going to find five different types of customers, right? Mm -hmm. Because their pricing position, because where they're located, because where they advertise. So who are you trying to sell to? If you're in Jefferson County, your answer may just be Jefferson County residents, and that's okay. But Jefferson County residents are probably not trying to target Gadsden County residents unless they're selling in a store over there, right? So who are you trying to sell to? And then where will your products be sold? So the idea is to align the two. That way you can assure yourself of better of, for, of success. So we see sometimes see that misalignment where you're trying to sell to someone in a target market, but you're in the wrong location. So who, like first we have to decide, and it's, demo, it's sometimes it's demographic based. Is it black or white, male or female, old or young? Because that makes a difference on where you go as well. And then promotion. So what are the key marketing methods to accomplish sales? And what do you need to do to win the market? So there's some companies that when you say their name, everybody knows them, right? And they figured out their way of doing that. So how are you marketing yourself? Um, is it partnerships? Are you trying to utilize restaurants? Because some restaurants are really good about telling you where their food comes from, right? And that's how they do their cross promotion. Because they're like, hey, we're food to the table, but these are the, these are the, these are the farms that we use, and they are now it's soft advertisement for that farmer because of that relationship. But also, where is it just social media? Because some people, if your target market on not is not on social media, maybe you don't have to market on social media and just have a basic page. Um, if your target market's at the farmers market, you should probably be at the farmers market. You know, is it tell is it people that watch TV? You should probably advertise on TV. And we see that the billboards when we go down the highway, the certain type of clients like Busy Bee, and I see that I'm a Busy Bee girl. When I see that bees, you know, bees, whatever, I'm like, oh, Busy Bee, oh, oh, let me, you know, get over and get my banana smoothie, my banana slushie, or whatever, and that's my thing. But you know, because they know how to reach me, I'm a traveler passing through, and I'm thirsty. Right, 90 miles to Tallahassee, I get a little parched, and I'm ready to use the restroom, and they know that. And they took over that little, they took over exit 283 because every other gas station struggling now, but, but you know, they know how to get it because they're right now. And that was, that was placement though, right? Mm -hmm. They're about 45 minutes off of 75 and they know what is between 283 and this is 209. What's over here? Nothing. So they, they, they made sure they put those billboards up to let people know. And what do they say? They don't say they got cheap gas. They say clean bathrooms mm -hmm. and that's it. And you don't want over any mother who has kids, right? right? Any lady who has high standards. Because all they didn't say nothing about what they offer, that we have the biggest selection of snacks, we got bulk candy. All they said was clean bathrooms. And that in itself is enough to get most people to stop, especially if they know the route. So when we think about promotion, how are you reaching your people? Because they know who they're getting. And they get you with that gas, because that gas ain't cheap. But they get you because... If I have to use the restroom, I want a clean restroom. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm going to stop. They're competitive, they're coming. Let's go. Good. Well, as long as they got banana slushes, that's how they got me. I'm not going to lie. They're the only place around here that got banana slushes. So <laughs> something I'm not supposed to have anymore. <laughs> so now we get to the nitty gritty, the financial plan. This is where everybody stops their business plan. Because who wants to do this part? Oh, this is, this is a part that requires some TLC, some tender love and care. Uh, so it has to show the details of assets, your liabilities, your profits, and your expenses. So when we think about um, 
I'm just going to focus on that profit and loss. So when we think about your income statement, right, we're going to project out our sales. And with that, we have to be realistic. So, yeah, you said I'm going to make $3 million in three years, but you're making 100000 now. Is that realistic? <laughs> and how are you doing it? How are you going to scale your business that large that quickly? When we think about the expense side, you have to think this – Financial plan is reliant on your operations plan because how do you know what you need if you don't know how you're operating? So thinking that's why it's further along in the plan because we're doing that market research to understand the trends. We're understanding what are our strengths, what are we offering? We're looking at what our marketing strategy is because if you say you're going to post, you're going to put up billboards. Billboards cost money, so now you have to get quotes on how much that would cost to put that in the financial plan. If your operations plan says you need certain types of equipment, we have to figure out how much is that to make sure we include that in our financials. So in order for us to build this financial plan, we have to know how we're operating, we have to know how much everything costs, and we have to know to what capacity can you sell and to who you're selling to. So the financial plan is, the, is your st story and numbers. But to know that, we have to know every other part of the business to create this. So it's going to use historical information for existing businesses. So if you're an existing business, you've been in business for a few years, and you're creating a plan, we are absolutely going to leverage historical data to create projections. Because again, if you're saying my income is going to jump 10 times in a year, I'm going to ask you, are you selling a Walmart? Or like, you know, what's, you know, where are you selling to that you're going to just jump 10 times? Because we have data of the current you know, the current um, production of the business. If you're a new business, it gets even more technical because the banks want the first year in 12 months, meaning you got to do profit and loss for each individual month, and then you can do years after that. So this is where a professional comes in handy or um, someone at the Small Business Development Center since it's free. Um, a good financial plan should assist with determining solvency, profitability, and liquidity. So the bank wants you to be able to tell them how are you going to make money? How can we guarantee you're going to make that payment back to us? And so you're going to tell a story in words, and then you're going to tell that story in numbers. And then it's going to help make important decisions about production, financing, and investment. So when we're creating this financial, this financial plan, you may not recognize how much you need. And so then we might start shifting some things and saying, well, you know, I did want that tractor, but... I honestly don't need it to year three. Can we push that expense from year one to year three? Because now that I'm looking at the total, it's more than what I anticipated. Because the bank wants a hard number. And they want the plan to know why, you know, where'd you get that number from? So the financial plan is your justification for why you need it. Um, I remember I wrote a plan for someone and we fought over the telephone system. And I was like, I'm, I'm adamant that you need $15,000 for the telephone system because of the type of business that they wanted, because it needed multiple lines. And it was a fight, too. We were, we were going good. We were doing so good. And then this is where it all fell apart. And he didn't believe me. He said, I don't know what I'm talking about. Cool, whatever. I ended up leaving halfway through. He took my plan and went to the bank. And he, they, they gave him money. They gave it to him. They gave him like six-figure Six figure amount, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know all this about. I moved on because I'm like, you know, I'm mad and in my feelings. <laughs> and then four years later, I think three or four years later, he came back because it wasn't enough money. And I told him, and that's the worst position to be in because if you have a loan and you're only partially done, the bank still wants their payment. So now you can't pay the bank back because you can't finish the project to earn money. You were better off just not taking the money. And so this is why when we create the financial plans, I, I, I'm not taking away from anyone's expertise, but we got to get quotes because quotes will help you know, protect you. That way the bank says, well, you're asking for 100,000, but we only want to give you 80. Look, hey, I have, these, I have these estimates from these vendors. This is why I need 100. Like this is a great concept. There's an opportunity. This market is growing. But in order for me to get it, I need this piece of equipment that costs $15,000. And the bank will normally work with you, especially if you have a relationship with the banker. So they'll work with you and try to figure out how can they help you get that loan or work with you with the budget to figure out are there things that you can cut and move around. 
So that's why we have, we look for the backup documentation for the financial plan because you don't want to be mid-project. And then how do you pay back the loan when you can't make, when you can't start your business? Um, and then what's included in a financial plan? So they want three to five years of projected income statements because again, the bank's thinking about their money. Well, if I'm going to give you a five-year loan, just show me what you're going to make in five years. Um, they want cash flow budget. Now, if you have a profit and loss created, whoever you're working with should be able to make the cash flow budget for you. And then the same thing with the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is going to guesstimate what you own and what you owe. So if you are purchasing equipment in year two, your balance sheet would change. If you're having income sales and you're theoretically, you're bringing in more money than you're spending, your bank account, no, you're that bank account is going to increase as well. Um, so the idea is to have this financial plan that's going to help you to dive deeper into what you need. Um, even if you're only doing it for yourself, it is a map. It is your guide to operating your business. So it's a lot of work. I'm not going to take away from that. But what it gives you, it gives you that five-year plan. So that way, when you are overwhelmed and you are working those 12, 14-hour days and you're losing sight of the goal and the vision, what you have is something documented to show you Oh, okay, well, this was part of the plan. I should be overwhelmed at this point because I knew I had all these things that I had to do. And then it also prepares you to look for other resources if you recognize that you don't have um, all that you need. So finding, I don't want to say volunteers, but, you know, having consultants or your accountant, um, a lawyer if you need a lawyer, you know, interns, whomever, at least you can anticipate that and, and, and try to mitigate some of the roller coaster you know, turns and the ups and downs, if you can at least anticipate them down the road. Any questions? That was a lot for financial plan. Either I'm that good answering questions up front. You're that good. I'm going to accept that. But it's also, you know, sometimes the information can be overwhelming. <laughs> okay. So management. The management plan is going to identify jobs needed on the farm or in your business. So sometimes it could be a one person show. A lot of times there's not. Um, and it can identify any legal and liability issues as well. Um, I'll admit, like me first starting, my brother surely was an employee, a free employee. But what he has is he has significant operations experience. So me, I'm in it, I'm in it to win it. But I get blindsided at times and I need someone that can see it from a different perspective that can say, hey, like you're work working really efficient, inefficiently, or why are you doing it that way? Didn't you know there's a software that can help you with that? But what it also does is um, it also demonstrates his expertise. So when the bank is like, well, you know, I'm concerned about you doing all these things, hold up. I have this person who has this expertise in operations and this and that. I have this person who's an advisor to me who has expertise in this area. And so I'm also showing this is what's needed for the job. But I also, I also included um, like advisors that have areas of expertise that are different than mine to show the bank that, yes, I'm able to, yes, I may not have all the staff that I need right now, but what I do have are resources. And I do have places where I can go and people that are vested in this business to ensure the success. Um, and so that plan wants to include the position and duties, but also the organizational chart so, like, if you're a CEO, who else is there? You know, do you have a board that's helping and guiding you? And we want to include that as well. Um, and then what skills and training are needed and what skills are do you have? Because, again, this we're, we're showing our qualifications here. So we want, we don't, this is not the time to be humble. Put it out there. I have this certification, this education, this many years of experience, um, because this is where you're justifying how this business is going to run and how you're executing everything that you said you're going to execute in the plan. Oh, sorry, sorry. Cool. So implementation strategy. We talked a whole lot about what we're going to do and all these opportunities that we have and all this research that we have to get done. Um, but how are we implementing everything that we just spoke about? Um, so we want to talk about production, financial, management, marketing goals. Yes, here are our goals. But then how are we implementing them? What are the steps to get us there? 
So yes, the goal is to increase revenue by 25%, but what are we doing to get there? Yes. Robin asked, do you know a farm that made it work without outside financing? Do I know a farm that made it work without outside financing? If you already own the land, I mean, if you're trying to, no, not really. Um, at some point, Norton, unless you already have the finances to do it yourself, um, you I'm not saying that you can't start with selling and save up your money to get more. You know, not all financing is bad. So financing helps us in gaining access to resources that we might not have right away. And it also helps in smoothing out our cash flow. So um, like if you don't want a loan and let's say you're already in business, like I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of line of credits. So when times are slow and you may your sales may have dipped and you expected that dip, you can pull from the line of credit to keep make sure you can maintain your operations and then pay back once the sales increase again. Um, it's just very difficult to do it without financing um, because even if you were to lease equipment and make payments on the equipment, that's still a type of financing. But it's it's very difficult to do it without some type of payment plan unless you already have the money. So when you died and left you a big... Yes, unless you <laughs> a, a windfall. I think right. I heard someone say, or someone say, unless you have a windfall. And I mean, and I get it for some folks, you know, um, getting a loan is scary. And that was my thing, too. I didn't want a loan until I was like, man, I'm working too hard. I'm working too hard. <laughs> and so I'm looking at one because, you know, I, I believe that what I'm doing is going to flourish. And at best, I believe I can make it enough to make the payments back. But without the resources, you end up working twice as hard. If I could get the resources I need to grow, I can then make the payment and sustain myself at a higher level than trying to save money to purchase thing one and then thing two and then equipment three and equipment <laughs> four. It's a lot more stressful versus getting that financing. Now, the biggest part is trying to get something that doesn't have a lien on it because normally they want some type of asset or in case you don't pay, the bank wants to be able to get the money back. <coughs> so documenting yourself and what you have helps in at least trying to not put your house on the line or something of the sort. And I understand that. So um, this part of the business plan will also help to identify bottlenecks and avoid pitfalls. <coughs> so when we think about implementing, this is really the process, <coughs> not step-to-step -step procedures, how do I plant this vegetable? But like, how do we implement our goals. So like, remember I mentioned at the beginning the baby steps and be exercising twice a week. But you know, what is my implementation strategy? What can I do to make sure I make it to the gym? So the goal was I was supposed to do it at a client because they're going to badger me and they are successful in the badgering. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm guilty enough. I'm probably going to go back soon because I have been gone for a few weeks. But you know, what am I doing to make sure that I'm successful? Does that mean I need to go to bed early so I can get up early and get to the gym? You know, does that mean I need to leave work, leave work earlier in the day so I can get to the gym? What do I need to do? What's my implementation strategy to make sure I make my goal? Because saying it and doing it are two different things. It's easy to say anything. But what are the steps required for me to get there? And so I had to start making little changes. I put my gym clothes right next to my bed because I'm not going to go looking for it in the morning. And I know that. So part of that implementation strategy is. I fold them as an outfit together and I put them somewhere. So when I get up, you know, I can put it on and then, you know, I make sure that, you know, I have gas. So I don't have to get gas in the morning. You know, there's all these little steps because, you know, the second there's a hiccup, like if I go outside, I'm like, is it 40 degrees outside? Oh, no. Oh, I can't go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that is me. <laughs> I know that ain't a drizzle. Oh, no. I know that I think I'm about to get wet out here. Just, oh, you know what? <laughs> It is, a, it is dangerous on these roads. So, you know, I have to think about what are all the things that I have to do to get, because once I get there, they're going to make me work out. But I have to get, and then the seven minute drive is like a 25 minute drive. So when we're thinking about what our goals are, you know, what are we doing? What steps are we taking? And what's our strategy for each goal? So if I'm increasing my sales by 25%, are you growing more? Or okay. decreasing your, your expenses. Decreasing your expenses. Okay. Yeah. But if we're growing more, right? Mm -hmm. 
it's grown, but if you if you do the same thing, does that mean you're going to make more money? No. no. So what's different? Like, are we reaching more people? Are you doing more events? Are you selling more wholesale? Like what you know? What is what are the steps to get there? Because say I'm gonna just make twenty five percent more, um, and then I love my people manifesting it, <laughs> and it's just gonna happen, right? But it's not the case. So. Um, not saying it can't happen, but most of the time we have to do something, we have to change something to make the goal. So the implementation strategy here is, you know, what time is needed? What does production look like? What does that marketing piece look like? Financing, if there's any other, you know, accounting for, because before we're going to increase our sales, we got to account for and know where we are, because sometimes you got to pivot. You might be mid-year and you're like, okay, something, something is wrong. I'm not, you know, I'm not making the progress I did. Let me pivot, right? And then management. Do you have the resources that you need to do it? And in this case, human resources, right? Do you have the right people doing the things to help you? Or is that something that we need to review? So that implementation strategy is critical. Um, even with the marketing piece, you know, branding your business is huge. People follow brands, people love affiliation. So and I'm only putting that here because when we're thinking about our implementation for our goals, if it's re relevant to increasing sales, if it's relevant to reaching more people or creating greater impact, all of that comes with brands. Right? You're, there is something of a brand that you love that you will not take an alternative for. So I told you I like banana I, slushies. I mean, specifically Icy, the I-C-E-E -E brand. I don't want <laughs> no summer splash banana Icy. I want Icy. But now, that's it. So, you know, there's certain brands of things that we enjoy because we, it's consistent, it matches our, you know, our palette, and we are good for it. And if, I, if there is no alternative, I'll come back tomorrow. And we continue moving, whether it's shoes, clothes, food, it's something, right? Me, I am loyal to my hairstyles. We are in a relationship. I know it looks bad, but this is on me this it time. Fine. Friday, catch me Friday afternoon. <laughs> but you know, I'm in a relationship. I ain't going to nobody else. I don't care if they're part, you know, we we are to, we are stuck together. And I am loyal to the brand, I am loyal to the service, right? So when you're thinking about your implementation strategy and your marketing, you want to create a strong brand that way when people see your company name. They're like, oh, yeah, I like that. Yeah, let me go over here and let them pass all the competitors to come to you because you built that relationship and you have a brand. So people with strong logos, strong websites, they tend to have more followers. We see it with social media all the time. And a lot of times, they're whoever the influencer is, they're very consistent in their strategy, in their presentation. Sometimes they have something they say in the beginning or the ending that's very consistent, right? They are creating the brand. They're good at brand awareness of themselves. So just something to think about when we're thinking about implementation is what is your story that you're telling? And then I want to talk about exit strategy because a lot of our farmers are aging. And what is the plan? Yes. Um, how can you find out about business owners that are retiring and selling their businesses? Normally there's brokers. Don't ask me who. Because I honestly have no, I don't have any relationships. I do know that there's typically brokers that um, business owners and entrepreneurs will work with to sell their business, and that will help in um, identifying prospective buyers. So if you're interested in purchasing a business, I highly advise looking for brokers um, in our area. I, know, I think I know, I've heard there's at least two in our area that will help in the buying and selling process of businesses. That's typically the best way. I have a question. Yes. Uh, this might this might be ignorant, but can you explain what a broker is? Sure. So a broker is someone that is basically they're the middleman between the buyer and the seller. Okay. So it's like a real estate agent. They're typically a broker. They're usually they're usually representing the buyer or the seller mm -hmm. when you're purchasing or selling a home. And it's the same way with um, brokers for businesses. There's just usually go to a company. And so like let's say I was ready to sell my business. I would say, hey, I want to sell my business. Can you help me? And they, they're going to help market it or also help um, headhunt potential folks that may want to buy it. And then they'll help you in looking and saying, okay, these are some qualified buyers for this business, and here's the bid. So they'll, they'll help with the buyer, the business valuation process, um, and then they'll help you in finding people that will, may have the resources or are interested in purchasing. So they're just the middleman. 
so for the exit strategy, you know, we're thinking about folks, if you're one, if you're coming into the farming um, business or if you have a business that you're starting or operating, you know, what is your exit plan? And honestly, this is one that for years I never really thought about because I was always with, we're going to help you start your business. We're going to help grow your business. I want to help you with your accounting. And then one day I had a client that was like, I'm ready to retire. I'm tired. I'm old. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And then we started looking at the things like, okay, let's look at your social security. Man, avoiding taxes for a lifetime doesn't help when you're trying to rely on social security right. because it's based off of your taxes and what you pay in. But also, you know, they ended up selling the business, which is what they, that was their retirement plan because the, the current, the, the business that they had, there was, it was turbulent. So, you know, you have great years and you have three slow years. Then you have a really great stellar year and then you're just trying to maintain. So over time, you know, their exit strategy was selling their business. So when you're thinking about when you're in business and things are going great, you know, it's it's OK to start thinking about what age do you want to retire? And what does that exit strategy look like for you? So some common signals for exiting a business also are, you know, if there's poor profitability, if you can see if you want that keeping up with your accounting and you can see a steady decline, are you willing to pivot and try to maintain it? Are you saying, you know, I'm tired and burned out, I'm ready to go? Like I have clients now that, are, that can confidently tell me five years and I'm out in five years <laughs> and we're working now to make sure that those finances look good. We're really, you know, we're aggressive about spending, making sure, we're, you know, we're recording all the sales because she knows five years she's out of the game. So she wants to make sure she's prepared. So when she goes to a broker, she's able to say, hey, with confidence, I want half a million dollars or I want this and that because that's her exit strategy. Um, sometimes you're, you know, you might exit the business because of illness or death of a partner, um, financial issues. At times, it's just simply age. But if we can at least identify what does retirement look like for you, at what age, we can start planning for that, even if it's passively planning for it. Because if you're trying to sell it, financials are really important. Um, so just thinking about, you know, what signals do you consider an indication for you that it's time to exit the market? Um, and again, if you're starting or you're in and you're thriving, you might not think about this now, but it's something to think about over time because we don't until we're, it's too late. And at that point, we're trying to figure out how to piecemeal retirement versus thinking about it on the front end. So I'm very passionate of making sure that all of the lifetime work that you do, you know, can benefit you in retirement as well. So something to think, um, finding an exit strategy, holding pattern, um, no expansion or contracting with the business for several years before retirement. So like I said, I have a client that's like, they can tell me confidently they got five years left. So at this point, there's no aggression. We're trying to sustain, you know, we're sustaining because we know. Like she's like, okay, this is the level I'm good at. I'm already working all these hours. I don't want to do anything else. You know, 20 years ago, she was like, I was working seven days a week. I was ready to get, you know get all the money, get the business up, get my market share. Now it's like we're sustaining and holding that position. You can use the capital assets and exit. So the owner stops investing money and then all profits are spent with no reinvestment. So that's when you know, in the beginning you might say, oh, I'm putting all my money up. Everything I got is going into the business. At a certain point, you're like, I ain't doing that anymore. Let me get this money out and go on my vacation. I'm tired. <laughs> and I see the patterns. Because some of my clients are like, boy, you're living a good life. Like, I'm, you know, so how was the last trip? Where are you going next? But you know, they're at a point where they might decide, I'm just gonna use up what I can what I use up what I can and keep it moving. You know, are you winding down the business? So some businesses are graceful where we see like the reduction in hours over time, you know, the reduction in what they offer. And it's like they almost like they want to keep one foot in the game and one foot in the industry, and then it's like by appointment only, by request only, and then one day they close. And it doesn't mean that they close because things are bad. They just close because they were tired. Right. And so, like, one of my favorite Mexican restaurants, El Jalisco, not El Jalisco, um, oh, I just said the wrong, La Fiesta on Appalachia. When they closed, it was, hey, we were tired. We, we out in two weeks. Two weeks! <laughs> they were busy because we everyone was panicking because they had dollar tacos. So, you know, <laughs> everybody was panicking. What you mean? You ain't give us no warning. You're just, oh, just like that. But they were just like, we're tired. We're done. No reduction in hours, nothing. They just, it was like steady, steady, steady. Goodbye. <laughs> but they put in all they had and they just got that point of, we're tired. This is our wall. We're done. I mean, they're creating a marketable operation. So um, some folks, if you're looking at selling, 
you got to clean up the act before you sell it, right? Mm-hmm. Because once they come, once you have these buyers coming, oh, they're poking and prodding. They're looking under the rug. They're trying to make sure they understand everything about your business. So if you are considering selling as your exit strategy, that's when you got to clean up those processes, clean up those financials, make sure that you can, you know, if you're giving equipment as part of it, you know, make sure they're maintained because people are going to come. They want to see it. They're going to question everything. So it's like, you know, like when you're selling your home, you got to repaint the walls and make sure you got the new grass, the new saw out. You know, you're trying to give your best impression. It's the same thing with the business. So they're going to come and they're going to tear apart your financials because whoever is buying it wants to know that you're that you can guarantee the same level of success as what you're demonstrating on paper. Okay, so with that, that was a lot of information. I wanted to make sure that we got that in 90 minutes or so. So are there any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, thoughts, feedback? I don't have any. I don't have any. I usually have a lot of questions, but um, you did really a great job of covering this subject. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Even though you were talking fast, I'm from California, so I'm used to hearing hearing, you know, conversation go that fast. I mean, you covered everything. I, before I could even ask the question, you would answer it in the next two sentences. So um, I don't have anything, but I, I think you did a great job. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I will talk slower in future sessions. <laughs> no, because that's important. Because if someone's writing something down, we want to make sure they can get to it. Um, but we are recording, so you can always reference it on YouTube. And I did want to go ahead and put a plug in that in two weeks, we have our next workshop. And it's on strategizing for maximizing tax deductions. So even though I was just talking to Smack about, you know, being careful about avoiding taxes, you know, that's not always the case. So we're going to talk about what deductions are available and making sure that you're claiming them. And even if we miss the window for 2022, that's okay because we have future tax years. So um, please join us in two weeks so that way we can um, talk about, you know, ways of reducing potential tax liabilities. And if you have any questions that you um, were unsure of, I will try my best to answer with the knowledge that I have. So do you specifically work with farm farms? And I know you probably do other things, but... I do. Or, okay. I do. Okay. And, and, and is that like up and down Florida? Yeah. So actually I have clients all over the country. Okay. Okay. Great. Yes. Okay. And so if you have more information on this slide, I have Audrey's email. Um, so part of the program, uh, we do offer individual business consulting as well. So if you wanted to have a session where we talk about your business needs or what, in, you know, what, um, challenges you're having or even just some of your ideas, um, let me know because if, if it's covered in the program, I'll be more than happy to just sit with you and really work with you um, and it would be no charge to you. Um, oh, that'd be great. Yes. So who, do I, who do I sign up with? Um, so Audrey McNair, her, inform- her email is on um, this slide under the URL, under the website. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. And we gonna have a um, in-person session um, at some point. I know there was a, a kitchen tour, or is that is that on the calendar yet? So an in-person session with specifically with the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. So we just um, hired, or we just um, onboarded a kitchen manager. So we're meeting with her next week to discuss what the training curriculum will be for the kitchen. Um, okay. So if you have any areas of interest that you want to be discussed, um, please feel free to email that. And then hopefully we will begin those classes in April, well, not April, um, in May or June. Okay. 